Perfect. Good afternoon to everyone that's just joined us and welcome to our industry panel series event, Business is Unusual. We are lucky to have an exceptional panel join us today and I myself am very eager to hear the thoughts of the industry professionals on this topic. Before I hand over to the panel, I would like to quickly outline the structure of the event and how attendees can participate. The first section of the panel will be guided by a number of pre-selected questions that have been submitted by students and alumni. In the second section, the moderator will open up the panel to questions from the audience. We encourage you to think about your questions and once the panel is open, submit these through the Q&A function to all panelists. If you submitted a question via email and it has not been addressed, feel free to submit these again through the Q&A function because we did receive a lot of questions overnight and they have not been incorporated. Please refrain from using the raise hand function. You can also like the questions that fellow attendees have submitted to show that you would like to hear those questions answered. If you have any technical questions relating to Zoom, et cetera, um, that are not for the panel to address, please use the chat function as my colleague Anisha and I will be here to address those questions. Finally, at the close of the panel, we will say goodbye to our panelists and special guests, and I will be handing over to Mark and Melody from the careers consultants team. Um, building on the topics discussed in the consulting panel, they will deliver a short webinar on how to refocus your job search during COVID-19. I now have the pleasure of introducing academic director Yolanda, who will be moderating this panel today. Yolanda is the academic director of both the MSc International Management and MSc Management courses and has an impressive background in both higher education and consulting. I'll hand over to her now. Enjoy the event. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Um, welcome everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here today with you as uh, the chair of this session uh, with uh, um, so many wonderful speakers that we have today who will help us to give a little bit of an insight into consulting in uncertain times. Um, just a quick um, um, bit of information about myself. As Catherine Hill said, I am the academic director of the Masters in Management and the Masters in International Management. I have been in um, education for over 10 years, last 10 years now. Um, before that, I was a finance director of a um, business school in hotel management and I started my career way, way, way back in consulting at RCD Little and I uh, spent uh, over 10 years uh, doing strategy consulting uh, throughout Europe. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'm very happy to have Chris, Nicholas, Nicholas, James and Stuart here. Um, I think before we start our discussion, it would be great if the panelists could give a um, brief overview of, of uh, your composition and uh, your career path that you have been going through up till now. Chris, could you start? Absolutely, and thank you, Yolanda. As I said on the slide today, Chris Berry, I'm a principal at Carney uh, in London, previously AT Carney. Uh, I actually started my career aspiring to be a professional rugby player. I did that for a couple of years and then unfortunately had too many injuries and had to shift my focus and I was forced to rethink how to use my brain. Um, so I, I went to Japan actually and worked in the logistics industry in Tokyo uh, for a short period, which is where my family are from, um, gained some experience there. And then I moved to London when I joined Carney in 2011. Um, and since then had a variety of experience, experiences across different industries. Uh, but for, for the past six months, been focused on energy and capital uh, heavy industries. Um, so that's taken me around the world. I've spent time in South Africa, Houston, Middle East, Norway, undertaking various engagements, whether it's top line for some of the majors or looking at uh, cost reductions or working with suppliers on how they can work differently in sort of alliances or strategic approaches. Uh, outside of work, I'm a keen cyclist, or was before the, before the lockdown, um, <laughs> trying to shift my attention to, to kind of indoor stuff now because I'm currently isolating in North London uh, with my wife. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Nicholas, Eck, can you give yes. us a little bit of background about yourself? Oh, thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. So yeah, so as I said, I'm a data analytics lead at LEK Consulting. So we're a strategy consultancy, about 1,500 people across the world. So we do mostly corporate strategy and M&A. And I started out as a generalist associate 
at LEK, straight out of university, a lot of people in consulting, mainly because I had no idea what I actually wanted to do with my life. I figured something that would take me across a lot of stuff was a, was a good starting point. And then about three years ago, I moved into what was then our quite nascent data analytics team in practice. We've kind of been working within that for the last three years, defining really how LEK users, data analytics, all the way from you know, newer tools that are available through machine learning and those kind of things to both help us produce better advisory for our clients, but also working with our clients on how they can use and build analytics capability. So we've been doing that across countries and sectors, mostly in Europe. Um, and kind of been not unfortunately not had lecture like travel as much as Chris, but suddenly gone to see still of Europe off the back. Uh, outside of work, I was trying this year, so it's always a hill walking kind of background, um, grew up in Sweden, so enjoyed mm. walking in Sweden. I had a goal of doing all the three peaks in the UK. Uh, that is looking less and less likely, and I'm worried that it's going to get very crowded once restrictions lift, so I'm going to have to figure out something else, but um, that was at least, that was my plan for this year. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Nicholas Clark, can you give a little bit about the background of yourself? Sure, um, very good to meet you also. Uh, I'm Nicholas Clark, work for DHC Technologies, a managing partner. I look after the uh, digital business platforms horizontal, but I also work across transportation, travel and public sectors. Um, so, so my background, I started um, in software, um, doing a software design and developer for Lever Brothers to soak people. Um, uh, very enjoyable first four years working for, for, the, for Lever Brothers before going to work for a company called Digital Equipment Company, um, who were at the time the second largest um, technology company in the world behind IBM. Uh, had a fabulous time there as a principal technical consultant. That was my first entry into consultancy um, at that time, working for their consulting integration teams. Uh, I was very lucky. It's a very pioneering programs in the 1990s with the advent of the World Wide Web, 64-bit computing, all those kind of groundbreaking things at hand. And the impact on our clients was considerable. Um, so uh, that really you know, gave me the ground in to, to do a lot of the things that I still do today and still relevant today. Um, I moved into architecture in terms of IT architecture, not buildings, and worked for Compact Computer, Hewlett Packard in senior consulting and architecture roles um, before deciding to leave and perform a consulting business. Um, uh, that didn't work out, and invariably these startups don't always do. So I then joined Unisys Strategic Program Office for real-time infrastructures. Uh, a really enjoyable couple of years there before doing another startup, um, a digital startup, looking at um, how to make access to the internet more affordable for those that socially disadvantaged. Um, a couple of years there, a bit of freelancing, and then I joined uh, CSC as a partner to build their technology consulting business. And then uh, the merger uh, happened on DXC. I'm now a managing partner in, in, in DXC. Um, I still enjoy working with clients on solving some pretty complex business challenges. Uh, DXC as a business is very broad in terms of capabilities. I've just finished a, a five-year program digitizing the rail network. Um, Google Maps the track is probably the simplest way to describe it. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, very challenging, but, but fairly enjoyable and very rewarding. Um, Outside work, there's a, there's a bit of a clue. You can see in my office, I, um, I like playing guitar um, and I do, um, I do Tai Chi, which in the new lockdown, every morning before I start the day, I'm in the garden um, doing some Tai Chi to start the day and that, that sets me up nicely for the day. That sounds wonderful. Thank you very much. James, can you give a bit of your background? Uh, yeah, th thank you, Yolanda. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my, I, I work for GP, who are primarily a procurement and supply chain consultancy. I've been with them just over a year in the London office. Uh, and I currently, <clears throat> um, I've been working mainly in uh, consumer goods. Uh, Fresh Fruit is the current client that I'm working for in Europe. So most of my work has been based um, and still is in Europe. I'm clearly just not on site, uh, like for everybody on this call. Um, <laughs> And uh, primarily what I work is I'm from a transformation background. So I do all the business change, the transformation, the change management, the large complex program side of it. I'm not a procurement expert by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a transformation and uh, business change uh, consultant by, you know, by, by experience. 
Uh, and so that's what I do. I'm currently running a, a large program now to basically overhaul most of the business processes and value across the entire value chain of the current clients, which is a, a new service really for, for GP. Um, before that, I spent uh, four years at KPMG. Um, I was, again, I was in operational transformation, primarily in universities. That was my, I, I was in KPMG's uh, higher education practice. So I was, uh, I'll, that. So I'll move swiftly on from that before I, uh, before I get disconnected. Um, but I am very, very, very passionate about the public sector and higher education sector. Um, and previous to that, I spent 16 years in the British Army as an officer. So uh, 16 years of that, I was in the Royal Tank Regiment um, uh, and retired as a major and then moved across to consulting. So I've only been consulting just for five years. And I'm sure there's normally the question that comes along of how on earth does that measure it being in the army? Uh, but we'll see, what we get. we'll see what we get to later on. So thank you very much for having me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, James. And Stuart, you're the last one. Okay, thank you. And hello, good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Um, so my name's Stuart Reeves. I am Senior Managing Partner at DXC Technology, and I'm responsible for the consulting business in the UK, Ireland, Israel, Middle East, and Africa. DXC Technology, in case you've never heard of us, uh, was formed out of a part of Hewlett Packard and uh, CSC Technology. We're a $20 billion global company. Uh, most notably, things you may have seen, the Nightingale Hospitals, we help equip those hospitals. That's a very, very current part of our COVID-19 activity. If you use the Oyster Card in London, we're the technology behind that that makes it work. And we're also um, BMW's partner for autonomous driving. So no one's heard of us, but we do lots of things nice. behind the scenes that make things work. So, so my, my, um, my career, my background, so I've been working for 34 years. Um, I originally started in marketing, so I was a client for 15 years. My first job was with 3M in videotape for people who know what videotape is. Um, but people know post-it notes, which is what 3M are most famous for. I then worked for Kodak, uh, for people that know who Kodak were, your biggest film company in the world when I worked for them. Um, and then a British company called Hayes. And, and when I worked for Hayes, I was a marketing person, but I, I early in the 90s, I, I launched contact centers. So when First Direct Bank started in the retail market, at the same time, I used the same advice as they used to to create a business to business contact center. That then I then built around contact centers for eight to nine years and, and that got me into consulting. So 20 years ago, I started consulting at PricewaterhouseCoopers um, as a, what was then called CRM, a customer management consultant. We now call that digital. We just rename things every few years. <laughs> um, and now I spent 20 years in consulting with PwC and then IBM and then DXC. Um, the work I do with clients is all around transformation, strategy, transformation, business change. I run consulting practices. I live and work in the UK. But I've lived and worked in the Netherlands for two years in Amsterdam. And I've lived and worked in China for four years in my consulting career as well. And in my 20 years as a consultant, I, I know for a fact I've been away from my bed at home for about 70% of the time. So travel, <laughs> consulting go together. Um, but I've been doing it for 20 years, so I must like it. And then, um, and then outside, outside of work, um, you know, I've got a wife, two young children. I'm really passionate about music, anything that runs on petrol or goes quickly, uh, fitness. I used to be a fitness instructor as well as my consulting career. And, and pre-COVID, I like travel. So the, <laughs> those are the things that and... Um, it, you know, and running around with my kids is what keeps me happy outside of work. And really good to be here with all of you. Rebecca. Good, good. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, of giving um, more insights in, into your career and the backgrounds. Um, so let's start with some of the questions that we have. Uh, and I think since the title of, of this webinar is all about consulting in uncertain times, uh, actually the main question that comes to mind immediately is, is consulting in, in uncertain times indeed different than in normal times? Um, so James, uh, could you comment on that? Um, again, all these are very subjective, and I think we'll all, we'll all come from very different points of view, depending on what our normal you know, routine was. 
to me, if you take the fact that travel and ways of working and what any industry is going through at the moment, we're having to slightly adapt. I don't think so from my point of view, in the mm -hmm. sense of where I normally work business, there are business challenges, no matter what, good times, bad times. We're not, we're, we're not going to be as consultants normally as a company. If a company's fine and has no problems, whether they be failing or need to grow, we're not normally going to be asked to come in. It's because they've got a problem they can't solve themselves or they need extra horsepower or whatever it happens to be. And so we're normally there to solve them with quite complex challenges. And business challenges evolve no matter what they are. At the moment, there is a fairly unique set of challenges that are presenting the companies that I'm working with, especially around supply chain, customer focused, you know, working with retail. But there's always been a challenge with that, uh, whether it be the different channels with the digital revolution, uh, whether it be different shopping preferences, whether it be consumer preferences, there are always going to be another challenge coming through. So, so my personal view from a high level is what I'm seeing with our customers and I, sorry, our clients is there are a, certainly a number of themes that are being caused by the current circumstances of COVID. But underlying those, if you actually peel it back, it's the same issues and themes they've had for a number of years now. It's just a different driver and lever that's causing those. So I think from my personal point where I'm working, yeah, there are some challenging circumstances, but really I think it's, it, it is actually business as usual for a lot of the stuff we're doing. Okay, Chris. Do you agree with uh, James on that? I do, yeah. And I, um, I used to focus uh, quite a bit on oil and gas. So I'm fairly used to seeing cycles in what is a volatile sector. And it, so it's quite a similar notion what we're going through now. And what you normally see is, you know, as soon as things start to change so rapidly, there's a bit of a deer in headlights moment. And... Um, with a lot of uncertainty and unfamiliarity with the situation. And then as, I mean, gradually, as, as James says, it becomes a bit more, okay, we faced quite similar challenges before and how have we reacted, reacted to that. So kind of the notion and the areas of focus change a little bit. Um, you know, it might be less about uh, expansion or top line and a little bit more around cost or cash or surety of supply or visibility of your supply chain. Um, but the but the conversations are, are no less than they were were before, and the, the importance of the advice is, is still as valuable, if not more. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else who wants to comment or add some thoughts on this one? I think it's interesting from an un uncertain point of view because I think there is a there is a sweet spot of consulting uncertainty. Certainly, when things are strategic, too little uncertainty, no one knows what they're doing, and as James said, no one brings you in. I've certainly felt we've urge too far to the right though so there's a point there's just too much uncertainty where there is um especially if you think corporate when we think corporate strategy and the clients end up talking to are on the there is so much uncertainty i cannot yet really think about planning and we're starting to see that dial down a little bit we start to narrow down the scope possibilities but there is just we kind of swung too far the other side that there is too much uncertainty for people really feeling there is a framework something to bring in external advice around okay nicholas i saw you wanted to react yeah to I, I completely agree with everything you said and the last point is interesting because one of the things we find with our clients so the dt does a lot of um ito business so we run lots of data centers so actually with some of our clients the, the priority suddenly is just keeping the lights on it's just keeping the fact that they can support all these as people working from home can keep the business running. So there was an immediate change of priority in that regard. But I also agree with um, the points my dad James made at the start, which was, um, I mean, the role of a consultant is to deal with ambiguity and uncertainty. That's, that's one of the reasons why it's quite exciting to be in consultancy, if you like that. So it's, it's turning up to client meetings and not really, you think you're gonna talk about one subject, but we may end up switching to another. And I know this is unprecedented and this is an extreme example, but I, I don't really see that being any different. It's just a different set of business challenges, a different a reprioritization of business challenges. And I think it's still incumbent on us and ultimately want to be trusted advisors for our clients. They turn to us and say, I know we were going to talk about something else, but this thing called COVID has happened. So you know what are your thoughts and then maybe they get some reassurance from us um if we if we apply that sort of calmness um we may not feel calm but um you know again i think that's where the role is very consistent okay yeah, 
Yeah, and I, I, I would just add, yeah, thank you. So I think there's, there's a couple of points I'd want to make. I, I think first of all is, um, well, well, first of all, COVID-19, what we're living through now is, is almost certainly the biggest uncertainty and the biggest economic event for the world since World War II. Yeah, you know, even bigger than the recession of 2008. So it's a time of massive uncertainty. But also, I think there is always uncertainty. So there's the question of the degree of uncertainty. And then the greater the uncertainty, the greater you see sacred cows being, you know, going away or taboos being broken and you see greater innovation. So I think that's the first point. So now, for example, clients I work with, I work with a lot of banks. Until COVID-19, if you worked in a bank, you went to the office, you could only access the bank's computer systems in the office. Now, the clients I work with, 99% of their staff are working at home. So completely something that was unimaginable at the new year, banks are now doing. So I think that's one thing is that uncertainty drives innovation and it, and it makes things become possible that were thought not to be possible. I think the second thing I would say is Clients don't just use consultants to help with uncertainty. It's a big part of what they do. But there are other things. Sometimes it's about strategy and validating a strategy. Sometimes a client knows exactly what they want to do, but they want a third party to come and help them do it. So sometimes it's about getting the client to a destination they already know, but faster and better than they would on their own. Mm -hmm. So uncertainty is a big driver, but I wouldn't say it's the only driver of why consultants are used. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I think I want to build a little bit on what of Nicholas said. Um, you, you are the trusted advisor as a consultant, right? And so in uncertain times, you want to support your clients. Could you tell me a little bit more, Nicholas, uh, you first, uh, a little bit about how you help your clients through those periods of uncertainty and mitigate their the risks? Um, I, I think there's a, there's a degree of... Um... So, so change is, I, I always had a false which change is good, right? Change breeds opportunity. Uh, that's, that's true of life generally. And whilst changes present challenges, they also present opportunities. And I think it's almost incumbent on us to be consistent with, with our approach, with how we present things. As Stuart said, looking strategically, but also being able to look at what's immediately important um, to those clients and that time um, it is about coming up with ideas it is about um, providing that assurance that what their current thinking is is the right direction sometimes it can be as simple as that that, that just that second opinion um, but it's also having the um, the confidence to tell a client when they're heading in the wrong direction when they need to change when it might not be a major change but it, you know a, a, a simple change up front can have a, a, a big effect on the longer term, longer term direction. I was on a call this morning just before this one about airlines, and I saw an amazing slide that one of the team had done on the analysis on the, the level of downturn in passenger numbers and how the airlines are going to adapt. They're going to have to dramatically change their, their business models. You know, maybe that's a bigger topic, but you know, their business models have been found out to be flawed. You know, based on how it used to be, um, but there's opportunity there. They go, you know, there's an opportunity for them to reinvent themselves, and that they will then come to, you know, consultancy firms and say, "I know we were doing all these things, and some of them are still important, but what do we need to do differently?" So I think that's where the value really um, starts to come in for those organisations. Okay, thank you very much. And Stuart, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, so, so in terms of how, how you support, I think there's a number of things. I, I think, first of all, um, it's about being authentic. So you bring experience, methods and tools with you. So I, I quite often use the analogy of you know, coaching an athlete. If you're working with your client, you're coaching them to better performance in some way. But then you bring to that a process methods and tools and experience so you may have worked with other athletes so in consulting we will have worked with other clients and also quite often in other industries or other geographies mm -hmm. so as you're helping a client through something um, 
more likely than not, it's not the first time you've done it. Occasionally you have first of a kind, but more. And if you take COVID, for example, COVID-19, we've helped a lot of our clients move to virtual working. In our own organization, we've been a virtual working organization for many years. So we, for us, it's fairly usual, not five days a week, but it's fairly usual. So again, we were able to help not only connect our clients, but also to some degree train them and coach them about how do you work in this environment. So I think it's important that as a trusted advisor, it's, it's like if you, if you use a lawyer, mm -hmm. you know they've been to law school, you know they practice law. In consulting, you don't go and do a consultant exam. So, so I think you have to establish that authenticity that says we can help you because we've done something analogous to your situation before. And then sometimes you're trailblazing, but then it's a different discussion. Normally you're, you're co-creating with a client and everybody's going into that with open eyes. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone who wants to add something about the role as a trusted advisor in uncertain times? Yeah, I, I can go. <clears throat> I certainly agree with everything that's, that, that's been said. I think in, in this current climate, in some ways, there's a lot of information that we're we're missing and we're yearning for you know testing comes to mind and getting true numbers of the scale and spread rates etc on the other hand we have a wealth of information there's all sorts of uh, amateur epidemiologists have popped up everywhere there's opinions left right and center you're not short of thought pieces on on this topic and a big role of consultants is to try and help clients make sense of all that data Otherwise, you're just drowning in it. So what are, the, what are the key questions that I really need to answer that are going to materially impact my business? How do I go about them? And how do I use the data appropriately? So it, it, sometimes there's a paradox about too much data can be just over. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Nicholas, yeah, I think yes. it's really interesting, on a, on, especially on an unsightly point and being actually honest with clients and other conversations I'm having now are very much in the realm of we don't know, no one actually knows what it is coming coming out of this, what's gonna look like, whether it is highly disrupted industries like airlines or even talk to industrial clients who are thinking about their their opportunities. But actually what it then turns into is starting to map out the scenarios and being there as an advisor to help paint those pictures and then actually being there or starting to figure out where are we going and on this well we often do as consultants kind of give that clarity, give that evidence base for saying, okay, it's looking like we're heading here and we're, we've preemptively together with you done the work to figure out in this scenario, what is the strategy? So you can help a client be proactive about the problem rather than finding themselves on whatever it is of the recovery, L recovery, whatever you're looking at as an industry and then being reactive to it, actually helping people plan that out. Okay. James, anything to add on this one, finally? Comments? The final thing I think is, what is it to be a trusted advisor? And it's not something that happens overnight. It can take weeks, years to be a trusted advisor. And it's like anything in life. It's not as consultancy to be trusted by anybody. It's developing a relationship where you can say things that are uncomfortable. You can be honest. We've heard all this about integrity and honesty here already spoken about. But I think that is a key thing to build towards. It's about partnering. You know, the consultancy industry has moved a long way over the years. We've all heard the horror stories in previous few generations. That is not where we were. We're partnering now. And it's about showing the client we're in this together. Yes, we can bring all this insight, all this help, of course, but it is, we're not just here to make money out of this. There's always winners and losers. It's, it's about helping you through it because we're here through the good and the bad times with you. And that's mm -hmm. what it's developing. And that comes with trust. Uh, and, and, and that's what we need to focus on. And I think the industry as a whole does that now, um, you know, where we work with partners. It is there to show we are here for them, you know, together through this. Uh, and lots more comes. And, and actually you find that actually through those relationships, yes, the other benefits do come of more business and, and, and you know, more work. But that's not what should be the driving factor in this. And I like to think most of us, although it is a business we're in, we're actually here to help people. It is a people business that most of us work with as well. And, and, and that's what Trust Advisor to me makes it so important of why I managed to look myself in the mirror as a consultant and go, why do we actually do it? And it is that part.
Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So let's now. You already, all of you, have mentioned it um, in in most of the, the things you have said. The word COVID nineteen has uh, dropped several times already. Now let's focus in a little bit more specific. Then on we, we talked a little bit about uncertainty in general, but let's focus uh, very specific on the COVID nineteen situation. Could you share with us us how much and how this current crisis has impacted your business? Um, has impacted trends, has impacted kind of the services that you are delivering uh, to your clients so far. Um, could you share that with us? Anyone wants to, to start with that one? No one wants I to guess I'll pick up on James. <laughs> I think one, one of the interesting things is having had a few of those conversations, which is actually to that, working with clients and being there for clients who um, are bad and good and I mean, one of the well-made points uh, I remember who made was no one's recession planning included revenues dropping to zero. And suddenly there are people in that scenario now and we kind of have to be there. And when that is there, you know, we are not there to figure out if we can sell, sell some work. We're actually there to have those conversations and figure out what can we do? What, how, how would we maintain this relationship? And then down the line, how do we set um, our clients up for success. So I've certainly felt felt a pivot there, and felt a bit of that, as Chris said, deer in headlight moment. Suddenly, suddenly last month there uh, were quite a few lines who stood there, and very understandably, the same way we did. Probably everyone else has called it as well. So how to figure out the simple things such as Zoom calls and how how do I keep uh, everyone safe and how do we interact and what does this all look like? And now, I think probably last week last two weeks really the conversations have started being forwards looking and people have gotten kind of from the house in order and started thinking about okay what's the opportunities coming out of this okay thank you chris yeah. could you oh steve Stuart. sorry sorry yeah i i would say we've seen phases I, I think you know the immediate impact was was crisis management organization so how, how do we work in this new environment so going to home working, et cetera, et cetera. We've seen that phase. I think that that's stabilized now and we're seeing companies essentially in survival mode, conserving cash, the, the mm -hmm. timelines on clear. So being very cautious, how do we get through this? What I'm seeing with some clients now is that we're starting discussions around looking forward to the new normal. So, and, and what I'm seeing as well is, is people embracing this idea of innovation you know do we all have to work in an office five days a week right um so i think what we're going to see and it really depends on the timeline and it will also depend by industry you know some industries have been hugely impacted some industries have been impacted but maybe not as much as people might think and there are some other industries that are seeing upturns you know very specific examples few and far between but there are so I, I think we'll, we'll see this moving to how can we go from survival to thriving in the new normal. And I, I actually believe we're going to see some really radical change. I, I've already heard different clients talk about severely cutting travel budgets and not bringing them back, for example, of, of moving to a hybrid mode of working between offices and, um, and home working. I think we'll see major changes in supply chains. So globalization has been very optimized. I think we'll see some parallel supply chains with more localization, which then impacts cost. Mm -hmm. But then you get a situation, do companies' profits reduce or the prices go up? But I, I think we will see quite a lot of far reaching and radical changes because you know, somebody else said, nobody in their scenario planning or disaster recovery or business continuity had the black swan of a global pandemic. And, and so going forward, business continuity is going to include global pandemic as a scenario. And that, that will change a lot of things. But I see within that, it will just accelerate change in particular industries. So some business models won't survive it. And we'll see new business models and innovation that take advantage. So it is. I, I the reason I mentioned World War Two. Think about the difference between 1938 and then all the war, and then the, the next 10, 15 years after the war, where lots of inventions from the military come into the consumer and business world, and it also changes society, it changes a whole bunch of things. 
I think COVID will do that. I think it will change the world in a lot of ways. Okay, thank you. James, you are, I think, specifically also in supply chain. Do you see anything going on in that area that's changing dramatically? Or Yeah, I mean, there's some short-term problems. And, and, and strange enough, and, and the clients I'm working with do work with the UK. And if we remember just last year, what everybody was talking about, those happy days when Brexit was the only thing we had to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, that, there was obviously that, and anybody who's going in out of, of, of Europe and out of UK, that's what we're trying for. So actually, supply chains have been gearing up for this, in, certainly with the clients that I'm working for. Now, they, haven't, they didn't quite put two and two together. It's like, you've, you've actually thought about this, but from a different point of view. Mm -hmm. So actually now, you're trying to keep the... Now, luckily, the clients I'm with them are in, are in the food industry, so they're actually protected. They, they get priority to keep the supply chains open. But actually, a lot of those difficulties they've been continuously planning on are now helping them out with what they're trying to achieve at the moment. Uh, because they've already thought about, well, what if I can't get through this border? Or what if I can't use this supplier? Or what, what if, what if? Well, I use the same what ifs, just slightly change what the answer is now. So in a weird way, some of the Brexit contingency planning has actually set <laughs> them up for the right frame of mind. Uh, and I'm not suggesting for one minute that Brexit, thank you for Brexit, has actually helped out. <laughs> believe me. Um, but I've seen that. I think another thing is, is as well is that the supply chains, depending on what you're in, is actually, again, driving that innovation, is driving some of the different way of looking how to, 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 to deal with it. Um, because supply, the actual um, hauliers and the people who are actually making the deliveries on behalf of it are having to now change how their business models work, you know, and change how they, even just how they, you know, the cash supplies, how they're actually going to bill, invoice, how they're going to make sure, you know, change the, um, the INCO terms, things like that because everybody, they've got a duty to make sure we keep all this stuff moving, but it's going to take longer now where we actually get the revenue and the payments and everything coming back because of just things are a little bit more elongated. So there's lots of things that are, that are changing there. And I think, as Stuart said, do we see everything going back to the way it was? Well, I hope not, because a lot of the stuff we're seeing now actually is quite positive within a very unpositive circumstances. So I think the supply chain, there will be some benefits out of this. Okay. Um, and I think the final thing, I think as Chris said earlier, everybody seems to be amateur experts in things at the moment. Um, everybody seems to be a supply chain expert at the moment if you read the papers. Why can't a government simply get a load of PPE uh, tomorrow? And I think one thing we realise is people are now taking a better understanding of, and I'm not a professional logistician, but actually having a more better understanding of what supply chain and logisticians actually have to go through and how sourcing actually works for everything we do. And I think hopefully people won't quite take it for granted as much what they what's been on their shops and what they can just get on the internet. So mm -hmm. hopefully it might change some of that consumer behaviour and might actually help us, you know, with less waste uh, and less, you know, frivolity in what we actually purchase. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, so Chris, maybe um, we have asked already about how it impacted the work right now. Do you think that after we are starting to come out of the lockdown, the demand for consulting sees consulting support or services will increase or will it level or do you think it will stay on a higher level what is your impression about that after this is so not only will it impact our current situation but also what will happen after this situation Chris could you yeah I think, I think that's a million dollar question for everyone in this call but uh, let, me, <laughs> let, let me do my best uh, I, I, I do believe it will it will increase as has already been discussed by all the panelists um, there are a, quite a few big, hairy questions that businesses need to answer over the next six, 12, 18, 18 months. Um, you know, one, many, but one of the big ones that comes, comes to mind is, is in supply chain, in particular in James's area, you know, businesses need to decide what that balance between cost and resilience is. You can you can try and prepare for every eventual scenario. You can have multiple suppliers. You can have reserve um, supply chains, etc. But that's going to come at a cost. So what it, what is that balance that you are willing to pay for in the short term? If we are going to have a hammer and dance scenario, as a famous article um, has 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 mentioned. So I don't think any of any of the sort of the need for support will will die down. We already talked about a change in kind of the topics, but one that we haven't, or we, we did allude to it, but to pick it up again, you know, all the panelists here are talking with, you know, CXXO level executives, and it's pretty lonely at the top. 
it's, it's pretty lonely when you're trying to lead big global organizations mm -hmm. and lead it with confidence and authenticity, but also you know, direction and give them support. And the role of a consultant, as James said, as a trusted advisor is more than ever crucial to bounce ideas off, to try and learn from other industries, other companies. So to go back to your question, I don't see the demand falling for, for consultancy. There may, there may be a deer in the headlights that says quickly stop, stop some spend on X, Y, Z, but it's not a long-term fall. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so then um, before I open it up for questions from the room, I, th I think there's one final question. I also already saw it in one of the Q&As, but it was also one of the questions I thought. I was like, so you're talking about uncertainty, you're talking about trusted advisor. Um, what kind of skills do you as, as a consultant have to have to, to, to be that uh, trusted advisor and to, to help your clients in the best way? Who wants to pick up on that one? I, Stuart, yes, go ahead. So, so okay, I, I think the, the, you know, what makes a good consultant, uh, and, and this is something I've observed in, in people you know, through my consulting, yeah, I think the, the, the first skill is listening. You know, people often think consultants, we turn up, we have a PowerPoint deck, we present, et cetera, et cetera. Listening to your client, and, and really actively listening is, is a, a massively rare and underrated skill. I, I think that's the first thing. So active listening. I think the second thing, every, every consultant that I know, myself included, is a restless problem solver. Right? And I'll you know, give you an example. When we used to fly around the world, you stand in the queue at an airport and it's really frustrating about why does the queue take so long to get through security? What, you know, and consultants are process re-engineering the queue until you realize it's actually very deliberate because there are security cameras looking at people trying to figure out is anybody up to no good, right? So the queue's never gonna be quick. So I think this restlessness about solving problems is very important. And then alongside that is a thirst for knowledge and, and also an endless thirst for knowledge. So always being open to learning. Because in consulting, we have waves. I started in the era of, well, I started consulting just after the millennium bug. And then the next big driver was customer management. The next big driver was ERP. The, the next big driver was internet and smartphones and digitalization. Now we're looking at big data, AI, et cetera. So there are always waves. So as a consultant, you are to some degree a chameleon you're always learning new skills. So I think that flex for knowledge. Um, authenticity is hugely important. Self-belief. Consulting is an up and down world. And um, believing in yourself, I think, is very important. Um, and, and the point that everybody's made, authenticity, gaining trust, earning trust. And trust is binary, isn't it? You don't, you don't half trust someone. You tr it's like snakes and ladders. You trust them until the point that you no longer trust them and they go all the way down to the bottom of the trust tree. So, and that sometimes means making tough decisions. It sometimes means, in a sensitive way, telling your, your clients something that might be a little bit unpalatable for them to hear, which you can only do if you're trusted. So I, I, I would say those are the key things. Um, what else would I say very quickly? Flexible embracing change, the ability to assess risk and take strategic risks as well in, in terms of developing your career as a, con as a consultant. The best consulting jobs are where you embrace change and you leap in and go try do something. They're not the ones where you've done it three or four times before and so you're gonna do it the fifth time. Um, that, those would be the qualities I would say. And, and certainly I would say it's not for everybody as well. It's emotionally as a career, Consulting demands a lot of you, but it also gives you a lot back. Mm -hmm. if, if you put that in, I would say that. No, thank you. Anyone who wants to add something to that? No, you totally it's, agree. This is the picture that we well, I, I think there's a, uh, yeah, Mr. Stewart's uh, I'm somehow, well, I think there's a, um, I think it's an element of um, adventure. Um, 
I, we talked about uncertainty earlier on. Um, it, it's, it's quite uncomfortable sometimes um, going to see a client not really knowing exactly what you're going to be talking about and worrying if you start to worry about whether you can solve their problems or not there and then, then that's going to be a kind of a, a tough position to be in. I think there's a, but I think there's a, a one of the bits of advice I got very early on was uh, never turn down an opportunity, right? Never, never judge an opportunity by how it's presented to you. You will be, it might be outside your comfort zone. And that was really solid advice because of subsequently, you know, I took on a couple of, um, of, of uh, in the 1990s, some major, um, I didn't realize at the time there were major engagements and um, it suddenly switched to everybody wanting to do it and I was already on point. So, and I learned so much and yeah, so I think there's always opportunities out there and, and also be a bit entrepreneurial as well. I think that's in a lot of us anyway, um, because that helps that business alignment and that client thinking. So uh, yeah, that would be my, that would be my thoughts. Okay. Okay. So, so, um, one of the questions that we were getting from the from 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 the from the group, um, and it's actually liked a lot of times. So I'm I'm going to see if I can uh, post that question to you. Um, so the question is: Are there particular technology areas that you were not expecting to dominate your consultant products that you would now, as a result of the new events? So are there certain areas, new areas, popping up right now that you would say to students, well, research those because that is if you have researched those you are well prepared for, for this, this uh, new world that we're living in. New technologies areas or new uh, industries or new product or service areas that you're thinking of. Any ideas? I think, I think we're all desperately trying to think. Um, I, I'll give it a go. Right? I, I, I think the technologies that are currently in play, um, things like AI or IoT or whatever they might be, they're still relevant. They're still finding their feet. They're still looking for their use cases. I think one of the interesting things for myself is, uh, and this was alluded to earlier on, is um, I think James was saying it. There was a this this notion of, of of resilience, of business resilience, of business continuity. Um, that I think what we're seeing is areas that were previously defined being redefined and rethought out. So it's not so much the technology aspects of that. I mean, technology will play a part and it'd be interesting how technology can enhance those. So I think really it's a, um, a rethinking of, of what we uh, have previously thought of, a categorization of a business area or a, or a methodology or an approach. I think that's really where the, where the real changes will start to appear. Okay. Someone wants to add something to this one? Stuart? Yeah, I, I, I would say, well, first thing is, if, if I'm sure this goes for all of us, if we knew what the next new, new technology is straight after this, we'd be buying shares in that company. Right? <laughs> <Don't you? laughs> so, but, but what I would say, I, I think, and we're seeing this already, and we're seeing it in different parts of the world, the relationship that people have with technology and what they're willing to give permission for, I think is changing really quickly. So here we all are on Zoom, yeah, for example, but that's a really obvious one. If you look at um, data tracking apps, you look what they've done in Singapore, and, and you look at, you know, they're doing that in Spain, obviously different because, you know, Spain being a European country, different attitude to say Singapore, to say China. But I think you'll see people giving more permission for more tracking and surveillance, if we want to call mm -hmm. it that, because there's, a, there's utility, there's a good in it, um, which would have been, again, particularly in the West, quite unthinkable or would have made people feel uneasy. Um, I think if you look at when people talk about things like big data and AI, you know, does the person in the street really understand what those things mean? And yet when you see on the news about how they're cycling through analysis of the virus and potential treatments using computers, it suddenly brings to life what technology can do mm -hmm. so what i think we will see I, th I think we'll see companies move very rapidly to leverage technology to what i said more of a virtual working uh, office working mix and for both white and blue collar workers as well but i think we'll see in society people giving permission for technologies to be used in different ways to make it clear seeing it for someone uh, i think we'll see that Okay, thank you. 
Um, another question which is liked a lot by a lot of um, uh, students um, is so, so we have now talked a lot about the changes and how it has affected your clients, but how has it affected your day-to-day -day life and how is your office and your company dealing with it? Um, uh, are you all working remote or how, 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 are, you, how is, are you recruiting people? Are you seeing this? So how, how is your company dealing with it basically? James. The, um, I think it, it varies. So I think on the whole, I, I, I speak from a personal point of view then from the business's point of view. So for me, I used to work home on a Friday, you know, the old five, four, three rule in consulting, you know, five days client, you know, client work, four days on site, three nights away uh, as a rule of thumb. Uh, it's now five days at home. So I've seen more of my family. They've seen more of me than yeah. probably more than I'd like to admit on this call. Um, and so there's that whole bit of now for everybody, not just consulting, this whole rechanging your personal life with the family and balancing it. I think we were talking before when we had we were, we were prepping for this call. I'm working longer and harder hours now than I was before, and I'm not even traveling. You know, when I'd spend 15 hours a week just traveling, you know, there and back into Europe. I think I'm probably more productive on one level because I'm very focused on what have you and what I'm doing but everything takes longer. So you said about meetings. I don't have frivolous meetings now, but everything takes a meeting because I can't just pick things up by osmosis. Where a quick team huddle, I could do it in five minutes or you just pick things up, you know, the old water cooler over a coffee chat. That's all gone. And so everything now is, although we're up more focused, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. You miss the wider part of consulting with clients and your own teams, the people elements. The people element is, an element, is really struggling at the moment. Just generally picking things up. I've heard everybody talk about when with clients, yes, we might be having that, we're there to solve the problem, but actually we offer so much more just by general conversations, just by general advice, just being there for mm -hmm. the clients. At times it's just enough for them because it gives them a bit more reassurance. That's all gone now. So I think the way we're all having to change our ways of working, some of it is good, some of it's not so bad. And I think as we get, this is going to happen for months now. I think we're all going to have to start making some slight adjustments in how we do it. We can't keep running. And I'm certainly my business to a person we're running too fast at the moment. We're running hot and it's self-inflicted at the moment because we're all trying to work the ways we did previously in a very new environment. And that's mm -hmm. something we've got to get. I think what we're also finding as well is that it can be at times, teams are what makes our people. We're traveling a lot. It's emotionally invested. I think Stuart said that earlier on. We, you, it, is a, it is all in when you're doing consultancy, a lot of our work. We've now got colleagues who haven't got the views of having a family at home or you know, people around me in a house who are by themselves or isolated. That, that doesn't apply to consulting, I know this applies to everything. But in our line of work, people a month ago were on site with people, with their teams. We had, we had the pastoral care, things around them. We're now having to change how we do that as well. And we're having to look after our teams in a different way. And that's something that we're all having to learn as well. How can we provide that same support and well-being and nurturing and mental health support in a very different environment. And these are very important, we're talking about sales, because at the end of the day, all we've got as consultants is our people. Yes, we might have clever tools and technology, but at the end of the day, we're a people business. And mm -hmm. our people are everything we've got. And I think for me personally, that is one of the biggest challenges at the moment, is how do I look after my team? How does my team look after me in this new environment? And it is, we are doing it. It's just those challenges that we took for granted before. So okay. I'll leave it there, they're the things for me. Okay, Chris, Chris, you're nodding a lot. Can you maybe, it seems like you recognize what James is saying. Can you comment a little bit on it? Yeah, I'll just pick up on the, on that people side. I mean, all the panelists here are leaders in their respective organizations. And one of the things we have to be careful of is reinforcing confirmation bias that we, that we have as we shift to, to virtual. Um, and I've seen a bit of research done that shows that for relationships that we already have, whether it's with the team or externally, those have actually just got deeper because we're mm -hmm. quite comfortable having a video conversation with them. And even then you have like a video or window into their lives. We talked in the panel prep about seeing somebody's background, about uh, uh, you know, Nicholas's guitar, maybe we'll have a conversation, a conversation about that and you get to know people a bit better. But you have to be careful that it's the people on the fringes that you may not have interacted much with except at the water cooler or having a coffee or lunch canteen or whatever it might be that they're not becoming more ostracized 
and you have to really work a bit harder to put your arm around everybody within your team and organization to make sure that people aren't being left out. And so you can do that in you know, some sort of structured ways, like creating coffee chats or whatever, but ultimately it's a cultural thing and you have to work hard on it um, in these times. Okay, thank you. So, so, so one, one of the sub questions on this question, um, before I think we're almost getting towards the end of, of, of our, um, our time already. Um, so we, we, you said you're, you're not, we're not seeing any um, big demand drops in the future for, for consulting. We realize that we probably have to be working in a different way in the future. How is it for your recruiting process? Is that also affected and how is it affected? And, any comments on that? Stuart? Yeah, so I think, first of all, let, let's just address the demand really quickly, because at the moment, cash is king. So the most powerful role in any company right now is the CFO. Everyone's concerning cash. So in the short term, that hits consulting. I think what that means is, as we look forward to the new normal, there's going to be much more risk reward type work. So I do believe that demand will be there for consulting, but it will be enabling organizations to go to a lower cost business model, and it will be much more risk reward rather than time and material fixed price. So it will change the demand pattern, and that will also potentially change how we recruit in terms of skills we're looking for and things like that. But what I would say is you, you, you never know how long these, these cycles will take, and it could be in some industries, you know, there's, there's talk of airlines where it's a seven year cycle to recovery. In others, it could be less than 12 months. It, it just depends by industry. So I think whilst that's always a cause for concern, if you're coming into a job market, what I'd also say is, goes back to the point I would you make, there's always opportunity in chaos. So even when the news is full of negative stories, because more people watch the news if it's negative, then you have to look beyond that. And, and so what I would say is, there's a couple of things. First of all, you know, the world is a big and different place. So the world is a job market. I've worked all around the world. Yeah, you know, I encourage people view the world as the job market. That's the first thing if you're able to. Uh, I think the second thing is, um, there will be opportunities in this time and, and it's really about understanding where the hot areas are going to be. So, and if you look at industries that are going to be hot post this time, or if you look at skills that are going to be in demand post this time, then those areas of consulting will, will prosper. And so there are always ebbs and flows. There's always something hot in consulting. And quite often I talk to my team about surfing waves. You mm -hmm. surf a wave, but you have to realise when that wave's going to break. And as a consultant, you pivot your skill set to the next wave. Good consultants are always busy because they surf the waves and they go to the hot areas. And the final thing I say, personal experience. I graduated in 1987, just as the stock market had the biggest crash since the global depression. Uh, I got a job on graduation. I moved in consulting just as the millennial bubble burst. So consulting was running really hot. First two years of my consulting career, it was in depression. Um, so both of those were pretty poor timing. <laughs> and the point is, I always found opportunity within that. So I would just say to people, don't, don't just look at what's happening right now and be in the moment. Look at where the opportunities are going to emerge and, and look both near term and medium term, because there are always opportunities. And, change ironically this high level of change is going to create more opportunities and some industries will struggle but other industries won't and and so there'll be opportunities for consulting in that and for careers in consulting within that okay thank you very much i think that's a very positive note if anyone wants to we're almost at the end of our full hour anyone wants to add to what Stuart just said over about the opportunities and 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 um potential ways to go for the future to our students and alumni. Any advice that you want to give them as a final note? And only a phrase that I think uh, I think Winston Churchill used, he wasn't the originator, but um, picking up on Stuart's point, he said, never let a good crisis go to waste. 
<laughs> well, I think that is a wonderful final line for our session today. Absolutely. Um, I want to thank you all, uh, Chris, Nicholas, Nicholas, Stuart and James for, for your input, for your insights. Uh, I very much enjoyed it and I'm sure we had a very good um, turnout. I think there were about 120 people uh, enjoying this webinar. So I thank you very much for, for your input and insights. Very much appreciated. Uh, lots of luck uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, stay safe and I hope to meet you again sometime. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you, you everybody. Thank you. Thank thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, this concludes the panel element of the event. Um, I'd like to say a massive thank you to the panelists and Yolanda as well for taking time out of your schedules um, to share your thoughts. I, I truly believe it was really fantastic discussion and I know our students and alumni would have really appreciated it. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Mark and Melody to present the thank consulting COVID-19 webinar. So we'll say goodbye to our panelists. Um, can I ask that any current students fill out the attendance form that Anisha has just posted in the chat? And I'll say to anyone that's signing out, thank you for signing in from your respective homes and engaging. And for any students attending the webinar, please stay online. Thank you. Aha, uh -huh. here we are. So thank you very much. That was a very good um, discussion there, uh, from which from your panelists there, Kat, very good indeed. Perfect, I, I was very happy with it and I hope everyone um, got a lot of value out of it. There I think it's very, very good actually. You. Thank you very much. Um, are you able to give me access? Oh, I can share my screen, it's fine. Can show Thanks screen. Kat. Okay. No worries. Thank okay. you very much indeed. Perfect. So, let me just share my screen. Can you let me know when you can see this? So what we're going to do, um, myself and Melody are going to talk you through um, our what we're offering for you going forward and also our, our, our take on partly what's been said in the panel just, just, just now, but also our own take on what's going on in the industry as well. Um, can you see, or well, actually, could, could anyone tell me if they can't see my, um, my, my slides? I think everybody can, okay? Yeah. Um, if, if, if anybody has a question, um, we, will, we will keep an eye on the Q&A box anyway but we're going to get started on this. Okay. So, um, this is us in the, uh, in the consulting sector, just to remind you of anyone that you don't know about. And uh, today we've got myself and Melody Cat is also here as is Anisha, uh, who doesn't exist in the consulting sector, but is, uh, is with us anyway. So uh, Melody, can you go over what we're going to cover today and give everybody a brief overview? Sure. Um, thank you for staying with us. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are joining from all around the world, uh, quite possibly. Can I just have a show of hands for, um, for people who are outside of the UK? Yeah, fantastic. And um, EU specifically? Lots of show of hands. I think there's a delay between clicking on and removing the hands. Thank you. And anybody here um, based in Asia or um, Middle East, perhaps? Great. We've got a really great mixture. Thank you. Um, and anybody here joining today are from the online programs? Okay. That's just Mark's clock, so don't mind that. <laughs> Seven people, thank you. Yeah, sorry, okay, you so today, <laughs> so today we're going to um, cover a quite a few things. Well, hopefully, we'll capture some of your concerns. We, the purpose behind these webinars was um, 
we recognize that all of you uh, are going through a transition. Some of you may be feeling a bit anxious right now about what's happening since um, the COVID-19 has hit. Um, and some of you may be in the middle of a recruitment process or perhaps are now in, you know, about to launch into this. Um, so we wanted to help you think through some things. We may not have answers to everything. Hopefully most of you um, joined already the previous panel discussion, which will feed into uh, this discussion as well. So we're going to look at some of the updates on the market. We're going to look at some recruitment processes. We're going to look at the things that you could be doing now to help you as well and are following this, this session today. Um, from the employer sort of industry perspective as well, we'll think about maybe what you've been going through, maybe some examples of um, resilience, perhaps how you've navigated through um, the job recruitment process. And we know alumni that have gone through that experience and uh, come out of it positively. Um, we're also going to give you a chance to ask some questions, of course. This is a really going to work if you engage with us. So feel free to use the question and answer box. Um, we'll try and keep an eye on that. And um, as I said, we'll try and help you wherever we can. We don't have all the answers. As you know, it's a fast moving situation and um, I think you appreciate that. Thank you very much. So um, moving forward, as, uh, as some of the panelists were just saying, that it's understandable that people are quite nervous at this, at this particular moment in time and how people are really worried about you know, whether they're gonna get the job that they want uh, in consulting, or in, indeed, in some cases, some people are worried that they might have their offer rescinded or withdrawn. As, as some of the consultants were saying in the panel just a few minutes ago, uh, a lot of what's going on is the fact that we're, we're undergoing um, a huge shift, not just in consulting, but in, in the world in general. And so, you know, things will change an awful lot. In the last three, four weeks, five weeks or so, uh, most organizations have been going through uh, a period of, of uh, crisis management. Uh, as uh, one of the uh, panelists from DXC was saying, you know, they're now going into a period of survival mode, and then they're gonna to start to look at opportunities for the future. But right now they're looking at, you know, how do we actually manage to sustain ourselves going forward? And then from that, after that, they'll start to look at, you know, how do we now build on and, to, and capitalize on any opportunities that this, this terrible crisis has actually presented with us. Um, so that's what's gonna happen going forward. Mm. So for those of you at offer stage, um, it is unlikely that it's going to be withdrawn if you were on the, if you were listening to the panel a few minutes ago, you know there's a lot of talk about how the consulting sector will be quite robust. Uh, it needs to adapt. That's the biggest thing. It needs to adapt, and you need to adapt with it. So your your offer is unlikely to be withdrawn. Though I wouldn't say that's going to be the case for everybody. There may be a couple of offers withdrawn, but that should present you with another opportunity somewhere else. So it looks like it's going to be a, a good industry to be in. Um, furthermore. Uh, what you may find is if you're doing an internship as part of your course uh, this year, it may move online. So, you, you know, a lot of people are now working from home. Uh, you may find that your internship is going to be home based as well and that you won't be going into an office and getting, getting to meet people so much. So you're going to have to be doing stuff on your laptop, working from home, having meetings via Zoom and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, um, a good way, just a piece of advice here, a good way to make sure that you've got an offer, uh, is that, sorry, that you, you maintain your offer, uh, is to keep in touch with, with your recruiters and keep in touch with people that you've, you've met and spoken with during your interview process. Don't disappear from view, but equally, don't pester them either every day and you know, with messages saying, have I still got my job? Just keep in touch with them, let them know what's going on, find out what's going on at their end, to a certain point for a little while still yet, they may not have any information that they can give you anyway, but it's always a good idea just to keep them, uh, keep them warm, let them know that you're super interested and super keen to come. Uh, it will strengthen your, your position uh, later on anyway. Okay, so for those of you at job search stage, um, I'm just going to, sorry, there. Um, there's gonna be a new potential. The, as I said, the world is changing. Uh, companies are, uh, organizations are moving into a new phase of, uh, of, of looking for sustainable uh, development right now, but also going forward, they'll be starting to look at taking advantage of opportunities. 
and with that comes opportunities for uh, yourselves. Um, at this stage, it's still way too early to understand the full impact uh, for many companies. And I'm not talking about consulting firms, I'm talking about companies outside of that, that consulting firms consult into. It's, it's way too early to know. Uh, some companies may, may start to vanish. Uh, some companies may still be maybe acquired by larger companies. Uh, there's there's going to be an awful lot of, of ground shift going on, over, I think, probably over the next year to 18 months before we can actually confidently say this is what this is what the situation is. Um, the the startup scene is going to be probably affected and the most. Uh, startups tend to work on a very, very tight cash flow. Unless they've got a big injection of seed money, they tend to work on a very tight cash flow. So you might find if, you work, if you're going to work for a startup that actually you're going to struggle to keep that particular job some, in some cases. So, but you know, I'm assuming that most of you here are looking to work in consulting, so you should be okay. Um, recruitment, at the moment, while companies and, and consulting firms are, are not alone in this, while they've been going through this sort of crisis management mode, they've been freezing uh, recruitment for the simple reason that they just don't know what the world is going to look like in two or three weeks time, let alone, you know, in three years time. And so a lot of uh, recruitment freezes have taken place. And so, you know, at this stage, if you're being sort of put on hold, uh, I'm being told, you know, when we're going to interview you, but just not yet, don't worry too much. Just, well, there's nothing you can do about it for a start, but don't panic. What I would say is it's just a case of they just want to see what's going on first and see where they're going to need to bring in certain uh, expertise and certain skills and obviously, you know, people uh, going forward with their clients. And um, Melody, do you have anything you want to add to this particular slide? I need to say that, um, let's bring the back can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Um, only to say that if you have got an offer and um, there needs to be changes from their business operations, just to be flexible and be open to that. Because as, as Mark said, things are changing and they may have to change dates or um, change what that internship or that role might look like. So just be open to that and be as professional as you can, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and just building on some of the melodies just said, um, do be ready for there to be a change. So. Uh, for example, um, I know of a student this year who applied for a job in a certain part of the world and they wanted him, they made him a job offer, but they said, look, you know, your job is not going to be at this office, it's actually going to be at this other office because that's where actually we see a big growth and opportunity going forward. Um, he wasn't overly thrilled with that because he set his heart on living in a particular city, uh, but he's going to have to adapt and you're going to have to adapt with that when, if and when uh, that particular uh, dynamic comes into play. Yes, and if you are concerned, um, you can of course book an appointment to discuss how you feel about the situation. Indeed you can. Um, going back to the, the recruitment process, as we said, it's going to slow down. For many of you, I know it's already slowed down. Uh, a lot of companies were putting everybody on hold while they were getting into, uh, you know, understanding how they're going to start to do assessment centers and interviews online for a change. Uh, and now they've got through that process, now they're gonna start sort of program those in once they've assessed the needs of the organization that they're working with. So uh, I think at this stage, be patient, but do keep in touch with them intermittently as well. So no, don't let them uh, feel that you've disappeared from view or you've lost interest. If you're genuinely interested in the company, you know, keeping in touch with them is gonna help you an awful lot. Just to add to that, um, if any of you are currently signed up to Management Consulted uh, mailing list, um, I saw that they are doing a webinar on Friday all about the virtual world. So what does it mean to be now working in a virtual world? And that's 4 p.m. Eastern time. So you'll have to check your time zone and see if you can sign up to that uh, Management Consulted. When it comes to um, the interviews, be ready to talk about, you know, we always talk about um, commercial awareness and I know, I know that a lot of you uh, went through commercial awareness workshops with us at the very beginning of the year. And I know that if, you, if you've been in uh, interview training with any of us, we've asked you questions about, you know, what's going on in the world uh, as well. I think if you don't have um, an, imp, uh, an idea or an opinion on certain industries, uh, 
as a, as a result of, uh, of the pandemic, um, then that's going to look very strange. So you know, if you're going to go uh, and interview for a consulting firm in their energy sector or their retail sector, then you know, read up, get, get to know what's going on in that sector and also have an opinion, not just knowledge, have an opinion on how that's going to be impacted uh, following this pandemic. But also, in addition to that, opportunities that they can take advantage of going forward as well. So be optimistic with this. It isn't all doom and gloom. In fact, to be fair, I think out of all the industry sectors in the world, consulting probably is one of the top uh, ones for, that should be much more optimistic for the future. Um, when it comes to getting ready, uh, you know, there's all sorts of things that you can do uh, with regards to preparing yourself uh, and making it, you know, sort of top of bottoming your approach to things. Uh, so make sure your, your, your LinkedIn profile is looking as best as it can. We can help you with that. You can book an appointment with us. We can talk you through that. We can review that with you and help you improve it. Um, understand what your network is doing. You know, don't forget you, you should be networking all the time. Actually, you know, some people say to me, yeah, it's really hard to network online. Well, actually, in some ways, it's actually possibly a little bit easier because, you know, people will take a call with you. And if you want to ask, you want to have 10, 15 minute call with somebody, they can probably fit it in better now than they could when they're actually in a physical office. So don't be shy in approaching people. The more people you talk to, the bigger your network will be and the more opportunity will come your way because it demonstrates a genuine passion and interest for something. Additionally, don't forget, you know, there's nothing wrong in having a, a, a B plan or an, and a C plan. You know, your, your, your number one goal may be to work in one area of consulting, but have a look at other areas as well. And as we've said earlier on, be ready to adapt what it is that you want to do to the changing market that's out there. Okay. Yeah. Now, I think, um, yes, yeah, so I think one of the panelists was talking about um, sort of being creative and look at where the opportunities are. So linked to that, there's no harm in you through your networking, finding opportunities to do a virtual internship. It may not be advertised, but it's a, a case where you could present what you can offer in terms of skills, your experience, and you create an opportunity to do some work for them during this busy time. I mean, there's, 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 there's room in there for you to explore. Um, don't just think about the things that are advertised again. Cool. Um, I know there's some questions coming in. Uh, I'm going to, we'll look at questions at the end of this. Okay. Yeah. I think that one that's just come in relates to what we're talking about at the moment. Anyhow, um, shall I, should we just pick that one up now? I think Mark, it's, um, what, no, we'll, we'll no? Look at it later okay, on. Fine. We, we may cover it anyway. So, um, just to to continue with the support we're going to we give you um you can still please do by the way book uh, a one-to-one -one appointment uh with any of us um in particular myself uh, and melody but you know do come and see us don't we're not you know we may be working from our homes but we are still available we are still working so it's not going to be a problem if you want to talk to us at all uh we'd rather that you talk to us than suffer in silence if you're unsure then ask us if you want us to check over an application or a CV, LinkedIn profile, train you for an interview, whatever it is, do ask, okay? Uh, each Monday between 12 and one, um, we're gonna be running uh, drop-in sessions. So if you have just a quick question, you know, we're gonna be here on Zoom uh, and you can find the details on Simplicity. Um, there's also the, the jobs board, sorry, the, yeah, the jobs board on Simplicity as well. So as Catherine comes up with, jobs from consulting firms that might be relevant for you she will post them on the jobs board so do keep an eye on those um, I want to for anyone who's doing case interviewing or is suspects they've got case interviews coming up and um, don't forget there is prep lounge that you can access any time of the day or night uh, you've got access to that using your imperial uh, college email address do make full use of that as much as you can as well when you're preparing for case interviews we can also do uh, case interviewing with you as well what I would like is for you to at least practice a, a good few cases on, on Prep Lounge uh, before coming to us, though, so that you are aware of how it works and all that sort of stuff. Um, there's, there's all sorts of stuff coming up, uh, not necessarily uh, totally um, consulting focused, but as we've talked about, there's the drop-ins uh, coming up. 
there is a workshop on how to uh, refocus your job search virtually. Uh, plus also there are um, resources that we use. Uh, Aspire is a good one for your LinkedIn profiles. If you want to run that like you did with your CV, if you want to run that through um, through Aspire or VMOC, then that will help you with your, uh, your, your LinkedIn profile. Again, get it checked with us. You know, human being is always good to get it checked by as well. Um, David Orval, who came and did a, a case training workshop, he's putting out lots of, of free webinars that he's, he's, he's running uh, on, online. Um, Melody's posting those on the hub for you to have a look at and register. Uh, for anyone who's interested in those, they could be helpful to you as well. Anything you want to add, Melody? Um, just that this is an ideal time to make use of virtual tools. Um, so if you're not already listening to podcasts, link to consulting, um, there's one run by uh, Management Consulted called Strategy Simplified. Uh, and there's an interview there recorded with a Bain uh, consultant that you can listen to the latest episode. Um, and there's also opportunities on other sites you might not normally associate with careers, research and networking. So for example, Reddit, um, you could find a consulting stream or conversations there. And it's interesting if you want to um, network and read about people's experiences in consulting. So be creative in the resources you're using now as more and more people are turning to virtual and online engagement. It's a great opportunity for you now. Indeed. Um, as, I, as I've talked about, there's some, uh, some, some things here that you can, uh, as a snapshot, you know, take full advantage of. What I would say going forward is if you have any questions, if you need any help, whatever it is, then do let us know and we'll, we'll, we'll do our best to help you uh, as much as we can. Uh, take full opportunity of the time that you've got and the time that we've got now, because, you know, after September, you know, we're going to be busy with new students as well, of course. Um, so we'd like to help you as much as we can right now to get you ready for uh, interviewing and ready for uh offer negotiation uh, before you leave, uh, before you leave mm. and Just to say that, um, to add to that, we know that you're leaving and some of you will be using and reaching out to careers more, uh, more even more this year than ever. But um, although we are busy with new incoming students, the MSC team, MSC team is looking at ways that we can also be supporting you. So um, we will communicate that with you um, later. So please do, don't stop you, uh, don't let, I'm trying to say, don't stop yourself from reaching out um, because we understand that there'll be more need and um, more support needed. So we've explored that. Um, and definitely look at our Simplicity available. We're missing seeing your faces. So if you can book in through Simplicity um, for appointments. Those of you who may be the online students who are new to consulting and understanding all of this, um, all our past workshop materials are on the hub. Let us know if you can't see this. Um, and also the David Orval series we mentioned starts with basics of inter case interviews and there's a four part series. So you could definitely follow those and sign up for those webinars. Um, shall we check the question and answer box there's anything running there not yet no no okay so um i've put together some uh some trends because there is a lot of there's a lot of good news despite the fact that there's so much bad news there's actually some good news which i really think that you should focus on it's easy very very easy for you to focus on the miserable stuff and uh, and the and the the depressing stuff but actually you know let's look for the opportunities as our panelists were talking about earlier on where are the opportunities going forward there will be opportunities in healthcare. Healthcare is obviously now at the forefront of everybody's mind. It, it needs not only you know investment in certain areas, but it's going to need to be much smarter going forward. And so, technology being used in healthcare is going to be enormously useful. And um, as was mentioned by the panelists, the the workforce is going to be changing. Uh, banks are now working from home as they are at the moment. Uh, and one of the panelists said, you know, at the beginning of this year. That would never have been even imagined uh, anyone working from home. Uh, I was talking to uh, a, cons uh, a consultant a few weeks ago and he was telling me that uh, he was talking to somebody at one of his clients who was Barclays Bank and he said you know Barclays are now looking around at their office space thinking you know why we why are we paying for all this office space when actually people could just work from home. So a lot of companies are going to be looking at how they use technology um, some companies, well, actually, to be fair, nearly all companies will now be preparing for the next pandemic. Now, the last pandemic was 100 years ago, but we've become a much more globalized uh, planet since then. So 
the next pandemic is probably not going to be in, a, in another 100 years. Uh, and so there'll be a lot more planning around how to mitigate uh, the circumstances around the next pandemic, if and when that ever does come. Supply chain, we had uh, James Fowler on from GEP. Uh, he works in supply chain. Um, the, so the supply chain is, is, is very, very fragile for some organizations. So they're going to be looking at how they can stabilize this and, and make and, and sort of still produce and, and, and supply the stuff that they need uh, to keep their organizations and businesses going. Uh, retail is going to become much more digital. Uh, the, 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 the people have realized that they don't need to go into shops as much now. And you know, being forced to use, the, uh, use online services has actually enabled people who weren't necessarily using it to actually use uh, online retail in e-commerce much, much more. Travel, entertainment, and leisure. Uh, this is a mixed bag here. Uh, travel is, uh, let's face it, people are still going to want to fly. Uh, or sail, uh, or drive all over the place, uh, people are going to want to still move about and people are not going to want to stay at home, especially after having spent, you know, two or three months at home anyway, people are going to want to travel. Um, what's going to probably happen is that a lot of airlines will go out of business um, over the coming, you know, maybe nine months or so. They may start to merge with others, so there's, an, there's probably M&A opportunities there, um, but all, they may just collapse and disappear. But what will happen, as was mentioned by one of the panelists, is that they've realized their business model doesn't work. And so they're gonna need to look at new business models. And so this is how it starts to go forward. Entertainment, home entertainment obviously has grown uh, enormously over the last few weeks. Um, you know, I know for, for example myself, I'm watching more Netflix than I, I ever have done in the past. Um, and so, you know, that sort of thing is going to is going to continue to grow. Um, and leisure, obviously, that's going to that's going to be uh, in a change in a in a set of change and flux as, as well. Uh, seeing where that's going to go will be quite interesting. Energy and utilities, again, it's it's a growth area within consulting. People will still need energy, and they will still need their utilities. Uh, it's probably just going to keep changing uh, and and evolving even further. So keep an eye on that. But there are four areas where I think actually uh, the post-COVID world could actually look quite advantageous and quite interesting. And as we've mentioned a couple of times, if you really sort of start to reposition yourself to adapt your, what you're doing and repackage yourself in a way, you could take advantage of this. So there's going to be an increase in data-enabled healthcare. Uh, we'll, you know, the, the country, the, well, all the countries are looking at how they can start mapping where people go, uh, who they're coming to contact with. And it's not from the point of view of, you know, where un government's understanding who's talking to who. Uh, it's all, all around, you know, can we contain very, very quickly another pandemic or even, you know, more localized um, epidemic. So there's that coming up. Um, digital business models will start to replace product focused operations. Uh, we were talking about retail. I think retail is now going to go much more online. Retail is currently going through uh, a serious period of change anyway. It already was for the last two or three years. It's, it's going to continue with that, probably with, a, with an even faster pace. Uh, retail is going through what the music industry was going through about 15 years ago. It will adapt, it will change, and it will move forward. Uh, but now is a good opportunity in consulting to, to really develop that even further. Um, given that, uh, as a result of that, e-commerce is, is going to fail. There was a big explosion in e-commerce uh, about eight years ago. I think there's probably going to be another one coming along now as well. People will start to understand that actually they can have things just delivered to their home or to their work address, and they can have it now. They don't have to go and visit a shop. So there's going to be an explosion in that. But also retailers enabling an online e-commerce uh, platform much much more and seeing it seeing the uh, the opportunity here consulting mm -hmm. firms will be here to enable them to do that and also in addition to that uh, here we are using zoom uh, zoom is okay um, but I'm sure that there are probably probably people out there who've got better collaboration tools and don't forget these collaboration tools zoom is one that that fits everybody but there are certain industries uh, for example uh, banking and finance 
who might need something totally unique and, and tailor-made for them. And so there's going to be an increase in those sorts of things. As I said earlier, people are going to start working from home. There's going to be a much more uh, fluid pattern around working from offices and working from homes. You'll probably find the workforce is going to be a blend of the two uh, in particular. And so digital collaboration tools are set to grow. So that's four areas where I think actually the consulting industry is going to be well placed to capitalize on these. Mm. You need to position yourself as candidates um, to really take advantage of those. Melody. For those of you who are analytics students, uh, maybe you are considering pure analytics roles or analytics consulting. Uh, maybe you are fixed on only working in the tech industry, but look at the opportunities there for you now across the different sectors. So maybe it's the time to be open and flexible, consider other areas you weren't previously considering because there's still going to be demand for analytics. Thank you. So let's look at the questions. Here we go. An anonymous attendee has written, hello, what will be your suggestion for international students at no interview, no shortlist stage? In short, where and how to apply? When it comes to applying, I think you probably need to hold off a little bit because I think a lot of organizations won't yet have finalized their hiring plans. So I think they'll have people in the pipeline currently, but I don't think they'll be looking to some some may but I, on by and large on the whole most companies won't yet be looking to sort of uh, increase that pipeline now when i say that right now uh, that could change in the next two weeks so i think you know this is a very short term um description here of what i'm giving and this is just my own opinion on this and it will vary from company to company it will depend on the clients as well so my suggestion to you is at this stage uh, make sure you've got your CV looking as good as it is. Make sure your LinkedIn profile is looking as good as it can be. Um, excuse me. Identify companies that you're really interested in working for, okay? But also, not just the big normal ones, the ones that sort of sponsor football tournaments and, and tennis tournaments, but also smaller ones as well. Smaller ones with a very, a very sp specific niche uh, offering as well. They may be interested in your type of uh, qualifications, your type of skills as well. Um, Celine says, it is considered norm, uh, is it considered normal to apply to graduate schemes once we've graduated in September or October or are they looking more for students that are currently enrolled? Okay, so graduate schemes, you would tend to apply for graduate schemes at the beginning of your academic year, not so much at the beginning of the following academic year after you've graduated. Um, that said, it doesn't exclude you uh, necessarily. Uh, what you might find though, is that you're gonna have to wait another year before starting one if you were to be successful. So I think if you don't get, uh, if, you, if you don't manage to find something before um, September, then by all means start applying for graduate schemes again, but at the same time, keep applying for uh, normal direct entry jobs as well and uh, don't don't sort of make some applications and then sit back and wait for the job offers to come in, as it were, because that won't necessarily be the case. Uh, I would cover as many bases as you possibly can on that one. Harris. Oh, hang on, where am I going? Oh, here we go. Harris. Uh, for those at job search stage, what would you recommend for students to do to boost their CV and experiences if internships are currently limited? Um, if you're going into... Oh, here we go. Melody would like to answer this question live. Melody. What was that? <laughs> I think I you answered that earlier. Oh, did I? Oh. It's about job search stage. What could they be doing now? Yes. So we talked about networking. If we talked about networking, using virtual resources, I think that's key for you right now. And look at the opportunities within your country um, where the growth areas are. Um, because I suppose some of the information we shared might be UK, Europe. Um, focused so you need to do some good research uh, and discuss with past alumni in your locations there's lots you can be doing now and I think um, I think a starting point if you haven't already engaged with us is to have a conversation about what exactly are your concerns and what have you done in terms of reaching out and perhaps even reviewing some of your past application materials to check they're at the best they can be in terms of representing yourself your skills and your experience so George says, oh, what is the link to the advertised, it keeps moving now because other people, 
What yeah, is the link to the advertised consulting jobs? Um, there isn't, there isn't have, one link. No. Uh, what I would suggest you do is you know, keep an eye on uh, the jobs, jobs board for simplicity, but also, you know, look at your network, talk to, I would be talking to the people more, but also whilst you're doing that, uh, keep an eye on the jobs page of the consulting firms that you're interested in. Uh, but there isn't going to be, there isn't, there is no one jobs board or link to all the jobs advertised in consulting. Mm. And just to check in, um, we still do run the MSE newsletter and when there's ad hoc vacancies that don't get advertised on Simplicity or don't get put anywhere, they are on the newsletter. So I know a lot of you have uh, this coming in and most of you ignore the email, but do look at the newsletter and we have a separate newsletter for experienced hire. So if you're not aware of this, please contact IB Careers to make sure that you are on that mailing list for experienced hire newsletter. So it's MSC, alumni and experienced hire newsletters. Okay, I've got another question here. Uh, do you recommend to add into our CV a job or internship that we secured, uh, but that we have lost due to COVID-19? Um, no, I don't. You can't put stuff in there that you haven't done. The only thing I could suggest that you put in there would be things that are in progress. So if you started an internship, uh, then you could put that in as in progress, but you can't put down something that you, you haven't done. Uh, that would that just that might take up to space from the start but also yeah, it wouldn't it doesn't add any value to you at all okay um what would be your suggestion for international oh no i've done that one are there any new questions no i think that's any it. other questions okay no i've answered all the questions so oh hang on do you think young graduates will be penalized by the potential lack of the in-person experiences at the start of their careers um Ordinarily, a few months ago, I'd have probably said a little bit yes to a certain extent because everyone likes to meet in person. But we're in a new reality now. And fortunately, from your point of view, everyone's being interviewed online now. So you're going to have to you know, ensure that you've got you know, your, I would suggest you get your internet connection nice and stable, but you know, also be ready to deliver um, you know, online interviews. And don't forget there is an online uh, practicing platform within the Simplicity platform. You can practice a mock online interview in that. My suggestion is if you are offered a mock, offered an online interview, do practice first. But equally, you can book a one-to-one -one with us and we obviously we do that online now as well. So we can talk to you about that. You know, I, I talked to um, a student the other day, uh, but he was doing an online interview and I coached him through that. And, you know, essentially, you know, the, there are certain things that will, will help you with. It's not just, you know, how do you answer the questions? But, you know, I was also helping him uh, remove some posters from the wall behind him, for example, uh, that actually shouldn't really be in the background. And these are things that you wouldn't necessarily think are important, but actually we'll look at that. We'll look at the whole thing for you as well. and advise you on that. So do I think you'll be penalized? No, you won't. But you've got to be you've got to adapt to the new reality yourselves. Um, I think that's all the questions, unless another one's come in. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, no, here's yeah. another one. For MBA students scheduled to start in September 20, are there any particular firms that are exclusively seeking MBA students? Yes, there are. Um, so this, this is obviously a, an incoming uh, student coming in later this year. Yes, there are. Um, they vary. Uh, there aren't hundreds of them, but there are there are there are firms that seek MBA students. Yes, uh, and they have MBA programs. Yes, there are. But obviously, you wouldn't be starting until September 2021, uh, and so everything hopefully will be back to a new normal by then. Um, I think that concludes. Unless we've got just another quick question. There are a couple here and there. Oh, yes, sorry. There are. Is, the, is this support on simplicity and one-to-ones open to online students? Yes, it absolutely yes. is. Can I answer that? Yes, you can. I mean, I have a feeling I just did, but go ahead anyway. 
Okay, uh, it's a bit more than that because some of you have actually completed the requirements to give you access. That was the Foundation Career Success and the CV upload. Right now, if you haven't heard, I'm working on an alternative process which makes that easier for you so you don't have to complete all of that because a lot of you are working and I understand the pressures of that. I'm talking about MSc online. I'm not sure about the MBAs. That's a different, different uh, answer for that. But I um, certainly can answer for the MSCs uh, online. Um, Keep an eye on the incendie. That's where I'll communicate with you the new approach. In the meantime, if you'd like to book an appointment and you can't get in simplicity, email ibcareers at imperial.ac.uk and indicate your BA online student and send some dates and times you're available and they will coordinate that for you. Okay. Um, do you recommend a good virtual internship? Our course that or course that can boost your our CV. Um, virtual internship I don't I can't recommend uh, an internship or a course that can boost your CV no I mean it, I'd need to know an awful lot more about you than 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 I can't there's nothing there's nothing one that fits all I'm afraid so I'd need to know more about that that would be done on, a, on an individual basis um any recommendations for video recorded interview when you have to record yourself answering questions yes the mock interview platform on simplicity will help you with that are students graduating this year eligible for off-cycle internships? Yes. For how long are we going to have to access career services after graduation? Uh, there is a time limit on when you can uh, access uh, your career service. Um, you can have access to your career service for the rest of your life, uh, but no further than that. Okay. I think that's, oh, do we have another question? Please, could you repeat the email address we should contact to gain access to Simplicity? You should already have access to Simplicity. If it's, um, if, but if you have any questions yes. in general, then contact ibcareers at imperial.ac.uk. Just to add to that, if you are an online student and you don't have access to Simplicity, but you've seen some employer events, we've got some other sector panel events happening and you can't, um, book through Simplicity, you'll have to email Im IB employers at imperial.ac.uk and there will be instructions to give your details and um, I will definitely, I mean Catherine knows from the ER team but the other colleagues will be uh, aware of this soon. Um, there's a question around the career services, not just the one-to-one -one support, but if you're thinking about the careers resources, you have one year after you leave, up to one year to access them. Um, this is almost a secret, it's not a secret, but people don't realise if you sign up for Wall Street Prep just before you leave this year, and you sign up with a personal email address, you'll have access for life. So even though you've currently got Wall Street Prep as part of the service we offer you, you can have access to Wall Street Prep longer. There you go. We've had a new question in. Uh, I like this question an awful lot. Uh, on a scale from one to 10, with 10 being the maximum, how screwed do you think we are? Um, well, uh, this is an unusual question to receive, given what we've just gone through with the, the panel and with, with what myself and Melody have just delivered. Uh, I think you are on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the most screwed, you're on a scale of about one. You're not screwed at all. I think in consulting, there's lots of opportunities. You just need to adapt yourself and, and be ready for the new normal uh, in consulting. Um, but there will be changes more for consulting clients than will be for consulting. And so you're not screwed at all. There's lots of opportunity. Um, it just doesn't feel like it is right now because they're just coming out of crisis management mode. Uh, after that, it's gonna start to get better. I, I can feel it in my bones. Okay, um, I think I've answered all the questions that we've had. Uh, so I think um, I can see Catherine hovering. So I'm guessing that she wants to conclude uh, this rather fun trip around the world of consulting uh, with us. So over to you, Catherine. Thank you, Mark. I've got a little bit of a halo going on now that I've turned this light on above me, but that's okay. Bit, yeah. um, Thank you to everyone for attending for um, the panel and the webinar. It's really great to see so, such high attendance. 
um, can I just reiterate that any current students, if you could please fill out that um, attendance form that Anisha has shared in the chat function, that would be great. And otherwise, um, we will be sharing a recording of this shortly. Oh, I don't know when, but very shortly. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mark and Melody. Thank you Thanks and hope much. to speak to you soon. Take care, everybody.